The Annapolis is going to come up and uh, talk about the issues with reflux disease and hiatal hernias in obese patients. And it's something that I frequently see being primarily a reflux, an anti-reflux guy, as opposed to a bariatric surgeon. So I'm interested to hear this. Thank you, Dave. All right. Can I have my first slide, please? All right, my disclosures are as follows. I received honorariums from both medical device companies. All right, so um, I'm sure this will come as no surprise to the audience that as the, uh, the obesity so-called epidemic has increased tremendously over the last few decades, so has the prevalence of GERD. And uh, you can see there that it's increased and is now uh, affecting 20 to 30 percent of the U.S. population. And there appears to be a dose-related relationship. For every uh, BMI, for every three units of BMI, we have a threefold increase in the prevalence of GERD symptoms. And, um, and, and this has been found across the, across the board. This is a nearly uniform uh, finding. And this relationship between BMI and GERD is, is very pronounced. And it seems that of all the risk factors that are involved in terms of shapes and sizes, that the, fact that the presence of a central obesity uh, shape is the most important risk factor. Waist, so the waist circumference rather than BMI appears to be a stronger link with an odds ratio of 4.3 uh, for uh, affecting not only GERD itself but its complications such as long segment uh, Barrett's. And in another study, they found that um, the duration of obesity also has an impact. As you can see there, uh, an odds ratio of 16.2 for developing uh, adenocarcinoma in patients who've been obese for longer than 20 years. So truly, it's a, it, it's a serious disease. Now, um, the, the, the relationship that I mentioned between morbid obesity and GERD can be illustrated in this study here. As you can see, there's a stepwise progression uh, of uh, or relationship between the weight of patients and uh, the um, uh, objective acid uh, measurement of GERD, as you can see in this 48-hour uh, pH study conducted on 157 patients and in both upright and supine positions. And um, when we look at the causes, what could be the other causes, uh, the factors that might be leading to this uh, increased uh, propensity of obese patients to cause GERDs, um, we're not sure. Anytime you see a long list of factors means we're not sure. We, we do know that some patients have reduced uh, lower esophageal sphincter pressure. There's an increase in the number of transient uh, LES relaxations. They probably and most probably have uh, an increased prevalence of hiatus hernias, as we've heard so much in the bariatric uh, surgery literature over the last few years. Um, there is also an increased prevalence of esophageal motor disorders and also gastric motor disorders. And this uh, cartoon uh, demonstrates some of these factors, as I mentioned, the hiatus hernia, the, the uh, increased intragastric and intra-abdominal pressure that might be uh, uh, delaying gastric emptying, and so on. But do all these factors truly apply? There's a very interesting study um, that actually measured uh, the LES um, uh, sphincter pressure in morbidly obese patients, and also they measured the uh, um, motor, uh, the amplitude of the esophagus. And interestingly, they found that these patients actually had hypertensive LES pressures and hypertensive uh, amplitudes on their distal esophagus, meaning that, uh, however, they did have severe GERD. As you can see there, of all the factors associated with these patients, morbid obesity was independently associated with GERD severity. So there's, uh, there's apparently reasons or causes other than elevated LES pressures and amplitude, and, uh, uh, or sorry, decreased LES pressures and decreased amplitudes uh, that are causing uh, GERD in these patients. So we're not exactly sure what is driving this um, uh, rapid rise of GERD in morbidly obese patients. Now, having said that, we still encounter a lot of these patients who come to us morbidly obese, and what is the best treatment for them? 
And we've, we've recognized over the years that performing innocent fund application, as actually illustrated by, uh, demonstrated by Dr. Ratner and his team, is not necessarily the right thing to do. As you can see from the study, uh, there was again a stepwise incidence of recurrence uh, between normal weight patients, overweight patients, and, um, uh, and obese patients. Uh, a marked increase in, in recurrence of uh, GERD in, in markedly obese patients to the point that it's now recommended that these patients undergo weight loss prior to uh, anti-reflux surgery. And in morbidly obese patients, um, I think we all agree that a bariatric uh, weight loss operation is probably the most appropriate for them. And you're all famili familiar with these operations, the bypass, the band, the uh, sleeve, the switch, and of course, uh, lots of the notes procedures that are coming up. And I'm very briefly going to touch on how some of these might improve GERD in our patients. <laughs> So you know that the gastric bypass, I don't need to tell this audience um, that uh, it is associated with significant weight loss, but more importantly, it does reduce abdominal pressure. The, the best way it works, or the most effective um, uh, factor associated with it is that it completely diverts both acid and bile from the food stream and from the esophagus. And uh, also, uh, it uh, results in a very small gastric pouch, which hopefully translates to less parietal cells and therefore less production of acid that might reflux. And so this operation has been very effective in treating GERD in morbidly obese patients. How effective? About 80, 85%. So it's not 100%, but it is certainly very effective. And this shows you here, uh, uh, there's a, sub a, a subjective study on gastric bypass patients, pre-op and post-op. You can see the marked reduction in uh, exposure of uh, distal esophagus to acid in the post-operative patients. What about the band? This is a little more controversial. There are conflicting reports. Uh, there are proponents who suggest that the band does actually treat GERD, while others say it, uh, it actually uh, uh, um, is, uh, it actually is not, uh, does not improve GERD. And uh, however, uh, I think there is a uniform consensus that uh, if in the course of placing a band we encounter a hiatus hernia, then we should repair it. Uh, in, um, uh, with the aim that this would uh, improve postoperative GERD or, or prevent it. So um, uh, this goes to show you here what I was just saying, that uh, there is an increasing incidence over time uh, of, the, of new GERD symptoms in uh, postoperative patients. Um, and this is, uh, this is in patients who were not uh, suffering from GERD preoperatively. Now, uh, the sleeve gastrectomy initially was uh, uh, offered to patients who had GERD, but over time we realized uh, that this was probably uh, uh, damaging or uh, exacerbating to GERD, and there, and there are many reasons for this. Uh, when we create a, uh, a narrow uh, gastric tube, we know that this uh, generates high intragastric pressures. In the course of performing the sleeve, we also divide some of the sling fibers, which apparently have an, uh, an important anti-reflux mechanism or contribution to the, uh, to the mechanism. We disrupt the angle of his. And if we are too aggressive and encroach the incisor angularis, uh, uh, then this further adds uh, distal obstruction and further uh, deteriorates GERD symptoms. And if we were to operate on GERD patients, then we have to, similarly to the band patients, always uh, look for a height hernia and repair it. Uh, it's recommended that we re preserve a small rim of fundus to act as a release valve and to obviously not be very aggressive with our bougie selection. Um, and to date, I, I have not been able to find any manometric studies co comparing GERD outcomes before and after sleeve gastrectomies. Now, uh, yeah, just a short summary of some uh, endoluminal, uh, endoluminal uh, 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 therapies to GERD. Um, there is this uh, study that, that uh, had 22 patients, 12 of whom received streta and uh, 10 uh, patients who uh, received therapy through the NDO plicator, if you remember that. Their mean BMI was 39, 
and there was a reasonably high rate of uh, recurrence or failure. There was one in the plicator group and five on the strata group. And uh, this again uh, shows you that uh, there was uh, a, a, a significant reduction in PPI use in the plicator group, uh, but not in the strata group. And this is with a follow-up of 18 months. So in summary, um, uh, I think we can all agree that there is a GERD epidemic that is running parallel and hand-in-hand -hand with the morbid obesity epidemic. Central obesity is a risk factor, uh, therefore reducing the central obesity uh, and uh, BMI uh, is, uh, is probably a, a, um, an advantageous uh, pre-operative uh, uh, pre step. And um, there has been a stepwise correlation between BMI and GERD. And there may be predisposing factors that are as yet unidentified that are peculiar to morbidly obese patients. The standard anti-reflux surgery carries a high failure rate in morbidly obese patients, and uh, we often uh, encourage our gastroenterologist colleagues and our general surgery colleagues to refer morbidly obese patients with GERD to bariatric surgeons uh, so that we can treat both the GERD and the usually other comorbidities that are present. Uh, gastric bypass is a very effective, although not perfect, anti-reflux operation. Um, bands and sleeves um, may be effective, however, there are additional technical steps and uh, critical factors that have to be taken into consideration. And uh, we're still waiting to hear more about new endoluminal technology. Thank you.